Excerpt from Memoirs of Hadrian by Marguerite Eusena Marulinus, my grandfather, believed in the stars. The tall old man, emaciated and sallow with age, conceded to me much the same degree of affection, without tenderness or visible sign, and almost without words, that he felt for the animals on his farms and for his lands, or for his collection of stones fallen from the sky. He was descended from a line of ancestors long established in Spain, from the period of the Scipios, and was third of our name to bear senatorial rank. Before that time, our family had belonged to the equestrian order. Under Titus, he had taken some modest part in public affairs. Provincial that he was, he had never learned Greek, and he spoke Latin with a harsh Spanish accent, which he passed on to me, and for which I was later ridiculed in Rome. His mind, however, was not wholly uncultivated. After his death, they found in his house a trunk full of mathematical instruments and books untouched by him for twenty years. He was learned in his way, with the knowledge half scientific, half peasant, that same mixture of narrow prejudice and ancient wisdom which characterized the elder Cato. But Cato was a man of the Roman Senate all his life, and of the war with Carthage, a true representative of the stern Rome of the Republic, the almost impenetrable hardness of Marilinus's came from farther back and from more ancient times. He was a man of the tribe, an incarnation of a sacred and awe-inspiring world of which I have sometimes found vestiges among Etruscan soothsayers. He always went bareheaded, as I was criticized for doing later on, His horny feet spurned all use of sandals, and his everyday clothing was hardly distinguishable from that of the aged beggars or of the grave tenant farmers whom I used to see squatting in the sun. They said that he was a wizard, and the village folk tried to avoid his glance, but over animals he had singular powers. I have watched his grizzled head approaching cautiously, though in friendly wise a nest of adders and before a lizard, have seen his gnarled fingers execute a kind of dance. On summer nights, he took me with him to study the sky from the top of a barren hill. I used to fall asleep in a furrow, tired out from counting meteors. He would stay sitting, gazing upward, and turning imperceptibly with the stars. He must have known the systems of Philolaus and of Hipparchus, and that of Aristarchus of Samos, which was my choice in later years, but these speculations had ceased to interest him. For him, the stars were fiery points in the heavens, objects akin to the stones and slow-moving insects from which he also drew portents, constituent parts of a magic universe in which were combined the will of the gods, the influence of daemons, and the lot apportioned to men. He had cast my horoscope. One night, I was eleven years old at the time, he came and shook me from my sleep and announced with the same grumbling laconism that he would have employed to predict a good harvest to his tenants, that I should rule the world. Then, seized with mistrust, he went to fetch a brand from a small fire of root ends, kept going to warm us through the colder hours, held it over my hand, and read in my solid, childish palm I know not what confirmation of lines written in the sky. The world for him was all of a piece. A hand served to confirm the stars. His news affected me less than one might think. A child is ready for anything. Later, I imagine, he forgot his own prophecy in that indifference to both present and future, which is characteristic of advanced age. They found him one morning in the chestnut woods on the far edge of his domain, dead and already cold, and torn by birds of prey. Before his death, he had tried to teach me his art, but with no success. My natural curiosity tended to jump at once to conclusions without burdening itself under the complicated and somewhat repellent details of his science. 
but the taste for certain dangerous experiments has remained with me, indeed, only too much so. My father, Elias Hadranius Afer, was a man weighed down by his very virtues. His life was passed in the thankless duties of civil administration. His voice hardly counted in the Senate. Contrary to usual practice, his governorship of the province of Africa had not made him richer. At home, in our Spanish town of Italica, he exhausted himself in the settlement of local disputes. Without ambitions and without joy, like many a man who from year to year thus effaces himself more and more, he'd come to put a fanatic application into minor matters to which he limited himself. I have myself known these honorable temptations to meticulousness and scruple. Experience had produced in my father a skepticism toward all mankind, in which he included me as yet a child. My success, had he lived to see it, would not have impressed him in the least. Family pride was so strong that it would not have been admitted that I could add anything to it. I was twelve when this overburdened man left us. My mother settled down for the rest of her life to an austere widowhood. I never saw her again from the day that I set out for Rome, summoned hither by my guardian. My memory of her face, elongated like those of most of our Spanish women, and touched with melancholy sweetness, is confirmed by her image in wax. On the wall of ancestors, she had the dainty feet of the woman of Gades, in their close-fitting sandals, the gentle swaying of the hips, which marks the dancers of that region, was also visible in this virtuous young matron. I have often reflected upon the error that we commit in supposing that a man or a family necessarily shares in the ideas or events of the century in which they happen to exist. The effect of intrigues in Rome barely reached my parents in that distant province of Spain. Even though at the time of the revolt against Nero, my grandfather had for one night offered hospitality to Galba, we lived on the memory of obscure heroes of archives without renown, of a certain Fabius Hadrianus, who was burned alive by the Carthaginians in the siege of Utica, and of a second Fabius, an ill-starred soldier, who pursued Mithridates on the roads of Asia Minor. Of the writers of the period, my father knew practically nothing. Lucan and Seneca were strangers to him, although, like us, they were of Spanish origin. My great-uncle, Elias, a scholar, confined his reading to the best-known authors of the time of Augustus. Such disdain for contemporary fashion spared them many a fault of taste. To this indifference they had owed their avoidance of all cheap rhetoric. Hellenism and the Orient were unknown, or at best, regarded frowningly from afar. There was not, I believe, a single Greek statue in the whole peninsula. Thriftiness went hand in hand with wealth, and a certain rusticity was always present in our love of pompous ceremony. My sister Paulina was grave and silent and sullen. She was married young to an old man. The standard of honesty was rigorous, but we were harsh to slaves. There was no curiosity about anything whatsoever. One was careful to think on all subjects what becomes a citizen of Rome. Of so many virtues, if indeed those are virtues, I shall have been the squanderer. Officially, a Roman emperor is said to be born in Rome, but it was in Italica that I was born. It was upon that dry but fertile country that I later superposed so many regions of the world. The official fiction has some merit. It proves that decisions of the mind and of the will do prevail over circumstance. The true birthplace is that wherein, for the first time, one looks intelligently upon oneself. My first homelands have been books, and to a lesser degree, schools. The schools of Spain had suffered from the effects of provincial leisure. Terentius Scourus School in Rome gave mediocre instruction in the philosophers and the poets, but it afforded rather good preparation for the vicissitudes of human existence. Teachers exercised a tyranny over pupils which it would shame me to impose upon men. Enclosed within the narrow limits of his own learning, each one despised his colleagues, 
who, in turn, had equally narrow knowledge of something else. These pedants made themselves hoarse in mere verbal disputes. The quarrels over precedence, the intrigues and calumnies, gave me acquaintance with what I was to encounter thereafter in every society in which I have lived. And to such experiences was added the brutality of all childhood. And nevertheless, I have loved certain of my masters, and those strangely intimate though elusive relations existing between student and teacher, and the sirens singing somewhere within the cracked voice of him who is the first to reveal to you a masterpiece, or to unveil for you a new idea. The greatest seducer was not Alcibiades after all. It was Socrates. Socrates.